Hello, everyone. Welcome in. Happy Friday. And thank you for taking time out of your Friday, out of your week to talk with us, with Noah, Kat, and myself. Woo! Woo! As everyone hello. on in, feel free to say hello in the chat. Let us know where you're calling in from, joining in from. Um, and if you are coming in already with questions that you'd like to ask, please feel free to use the Q&A module of Zoom. That is where I will be sorting through questions for the Q&A portion at the end. While everyone is coming in, I'm going to launch just a fun little poll, kind of test our audience on their be knowledge and be interest. So I'm going to get that launched for us while we give everyone a couple minutes to come in. You should see a poll here. The first question is, what is your favorite non-bee pollinator? Kat and Noah, what's your favorite non-bee pollinator? Good question. Oh, I love hummingbirds. I was going to say that too. Yeah, I'm in San Francisco <laughs> today and there are surprisingly so many hummingbirds throughout the city and even in Dolores Park, they will come down like right in front of my face and just cover. <laughs> it's it's amazing. They're magical creatures. I agree, but I'm a I'm a butterfly girl through and through. Love me a butterfly. A follow-up might be a bat, but they're like, yeah, just so interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the second question in the poll is what is your favorite way to eat honey with some fun options here? Noah, cat, favorite ways to eat honey? Hands down on toast with peanut butter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually like to make a honey mustard dressing at home. That's my favorite use, but it's really chewy on ice cream when it gets kind of hard. Yeah. Yeah. The salad dressing, it's like the, that's kind of like my soft winner. Cause I do think it's the highest frequency that I'm using a honey <laughs> batter and coffee, but the most enjoyable is definitely with ice cream. Do you have it in coffee? Oh yeah. Huh. I love it in coffee. It's, it's a treat. Like I do it on like a, you know, a Sunday morning, you know, I'm going to have a sweetened coffee, but other than that, I don't. <laughs> I've had it in tea, but I haven't had it in coffee. I guess because oh. I drink black. Well, there you go. Yeah. And the last question is true or false. Honeybees have lungs. So we'll test some bee knowledge there. And I'll give everyone about one more minute to take the poll. Let us know where you're com coming in from, from Jamaica Plain. Cool. JP Boston. Love it. Boston, DC. Noah's calling in from San Francisco. Kat, where are you calling in from today? I'm in Situate, Massachusetts today, south of Boston. Nice. Rainy there too? Yep. Rain today, rain tomorrow. Nice. Yep. Nice, nice. quiet autumnal weekend here. <laughs> uh, Illinois, Alberta. Okay. Some central continent. Oregon joining me over here on the, the West Coast. Awesome. All right. I'm going to close out this poll. Let's see where our results landed. All right. Our favorite non-bee pollinator, 58% hummingbirds. I think Noah and Kat may have influenced <laughs> the results here. <laughs> but our uh, our second highest is 25% at the butterflies, which I love. Um, favorite way to eat honey. What do we got here? 29% is with yogurt. Amazing. And also really good. And we have 17% other. So you guys are going to have to drop, drop in the chat what the these other options are that we haven't included. And true or false, honeybees have lungs. 67% said false. Noah, what is the answer? Uh, uh, yeah. False is the answer. It's so interesting. They have these spiracles, these holes on the side of their abdomen. And anybody who subscribes to our newsletter probably saw this, I think, last week for a little bit more information. So they have direct oxygen delivery. It's said that any individual cell is no further than one other cell from direct oxygen coming through tracheals, these little tubes, these highways of oxygen going all throughout their body. It's a really interesting respiratory system, very different from ours. It's so cool. I think our next webinar needs to just be bee anatomy because I'm very curious. Yeah, when you see a bee pumping or even any insect pumping their abdomen like this, it's because they're breathing. Wow. That's that amazing. All right. Well, thank you for those who participated in the poll. I'm going to stop sharing that uh, and then just go again through uh, some quick uh, 
hot tips for the webinar. So the webinar is an hour long. We are going to do our kind of talking and presentation for 30, 45 minutes to make sure we're leaving at least 15 minutes at the end for Q&A, which I will be moderating. I'll be turning my camera off and turning on quiet mode while Noah and Kat present. During that time, I will jump into the chat and Q&A and answer any questions that I can ahead of time. Um, but again, please use the Q&A uh, tool of Zoom to drop in your questions that you would like answered at the end by our amazing speakers today. And I can't wait to hear from Noah and Kat and learn more about Best Views in the UBL. So I'm excited to jump in. Noah, Kat, are you guys ready to go? Oh yeah. Let's, Let's go. go. Awesome. All right. I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Right on. Well, thank you, Delaney. And I love hearing everybody's interests in butterflies and hummingbirds. We're going to talk a little bit about those today. Some of our research that we're doing relates to all pollinators and the information we get from beehives and how that informs everything. So let's jump right in. My name is Noah Wilson-Rich, and I am the co-founder, CEO, and chief scientific officer of the Best Bees Company. I founded Best Bees and our nonprofit Urban Bee Lab, along with my friend Sean Cahill, to create a network work of data yielding beehives to fuel my scientific research into pollinator health. Now I'm a biologist. I have a PhD in biology with a focus in bee immunology from Tufts University in the Boston area back in 2011. Now I've been working with honeybees for more than 17 years. I now lead our in-house research team of scientists and data analysts, while Cahill oversees our software engineers building out our database tools. And I'd like to introduce you today to my friend and colleague, Katina Bentley. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks, Noah. I'm Kat, and I recently joined the Urban Bee Lab as the Associate Director. For the last decade, I have worked in nonprofit management, and I have this unique passion for helping organizations in their early stages of development. Um, one of my favorite projects prior to joining the UBL was my role as the lead storyteller on a service trip to Malawi last summer, where I shot, edited, and produced a video to help raise critical funds in support of a specific school community in Malawi. Uh, that is so cool, Kat. Yeah. I wish I could have joined, maybe next time. Next time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your talents with photography and drawing this human connection are really awe-inspiring. It's part of why I love nature, because of that sense of wonder we get. I'm so excited to get to work with you. you. Now, since day one, back in 2010, our proceeds from the Best Bees Company's beekeeping services have gone to fund our research to improve bee health. In 2013, we had a wonderful client come into our offices to meet with me, and she wanted to learn more about her research. She wanted to donate to further fund programming efforts, and that inspired us to found a nonprofit. So in 2014, the Urban Bee Lab was born, and we lovingly call it UBL. Now, we quickly realized that UBL and Best Bees complemented each other's missions and their efforts in what we call a flywheel approach, where, we, where the progress of one organization feeds the growth of the other. So both work in tandem around a shared mission, which is to improve bee health in a way that's what we ecologists call a positive feedback loop or what others might call a virtuous cycle. Now, Best Bees installs and manages research beehives and collects data from them. Now, those data are then analyzed by the Urban Bee Lab, which then reports the results in creative and non-traditional ways, including keynote talks and TED Talks and magazine articles like National Geographic, maybe some of you have seen those, even museum exhibits and school curriculum, partnerships that are exclusive to nonprofits like NASA, MIT, Stanford, and the United Nations, as well as, of course, the standard peer-reviewed publications that include our book, The Bee, A Natural History, that was published by Princeton and Oxford. Now, the intention of our research results is to modify best practices continuously for what anyone can do to better improve pollinator health, from individual citizens like you and me, to corporations and institutions like the federal government, to every everyday beekeepers and researchers. We continuously learn from our research results and we tweak Best Bees practices for beekeeping and the pollinator habitat gardens to reflect our most updated findings. 
Now, the improved practices lead to new data sets that are then passed to UBL for more creative analysis, sharing, and continuously updated impact, like what we're sharing with you today right here in this webinar. And since 2014, we've been doing some amazing projects that surprise even me to this day. I never thought that we would be able to do such cool stuff. So I really want to do a deeper dive, peek under the hood, and share some of this stuff with you. Our work with the MIT Media Lab led to a project that was funded by the 2020 Tokyo Olympics construction team, where we rented out a large warehouse in Cambridge, Massachusetts to simulate an eternal springtime environment for bees all throughout the winter in a project called the Synthetic Apiary. Now, through Miri Oxman and her team at the Mediated Matter Lab, UBL's official research affiliation with MIT combined their approach of 3D glass printed buildings with our research beehives to design a living architecture with a pavilion made of 3D printed glass with living bees thriving on the inside and producing honey that could be collected from the walls by visitors to the Olympics. This edible architecture was to not be only awe-inspiring as an experience for visitors, but also truly sustainable in that the glass could then be melted down afterwards for absolutely zero footprint left after what was to be the most sustainable Olympics ever. As a side note, unfortunately, the bees hated it in the warehouse, and so we called the project off. <laughs> As scientists, we're working with living creatures, and we're extremely in tune with what they need, and we know when to draw the line for the sake of their well-being. We also get to, we got to file a patent from it, so it wasn't for nothing. And we got to feature this work as part of Neri's retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art across New York and San Francisco just last year. We also work with NASA in a program to for nonprofits with data analysis that's called Develop with students. So it was an incredible opportunity for Best Bees to expand its impact, and it wouldn't have happened without the UBL. Then, for only the third time in human history, we sent bees into space with MIT and the Blue Origins Rocket Company, with a little help from our friends at the USDA, who shared with us the very special union of healthy government bees, something that wouldn't have been possible as a for-profit company alone. Now, some opportunities require partnerships between academia, nonprofits, and for-profits together. And then in 2023, we hired Kat, and we are so Yay. excited to work with her and to grow the UBL and expand its impact. Thanks, Noah. Um, so I first learned about the Urban Bee Lab when I was exploring full-time work in the nonprofit industry. And what I love about this organization is the unique combination of cutting-edge cutting edge research paired with a mission that is really important to me. I'm super excited to bring my skill set in building programs and fundraising to elevate what the organization has already been doing and is set out to do in the future. It has been a busy few months since I started. I've been ramping up our structure and governance. I've taken ownership of the UBL's marketing, creating a social media presence, and I started a monthly newsletter with some volunteer help. And there's also been fundraising efforts um, between applying for grants, coordinating auctions and giveaways, and organizing events the UBL schedule has been jam-packed. Um, and I wanted to just look ahead for a minute and we have some several exciting programs I wanted to share today. And these are happening because of generous donations we've received. So just this month, as you can see here on the slide, the UBL Foundation provided funding for the development of a flowering architectural project by Dr. Rafael Luna, who will investigate the use of bee bricks and a tower of flowering lavender as a shared urban habitat for humans and bees. So cool. cool. Um, and with funding from Grow Boston over the next few months in conjunction with STEM efforts at both middle and high schools, we have put together a free online classroom toolkit, which encourages students to become citizen scientists. Whether they create their own bee hotel or sow native seeds, we hope to inspire, educate and build community. Beyond. And lastly, with generous funding from Cape Cod Five Bank, we're planning a native seed distribution effort starting later this fall. Yeah. So now that we've covered what's coming down the pipeline, Noah is going to dive into how Best Bees and the UBL work together to accomplish our shared mission. Ah, I love this. This is so much bigger than any one person or one community can do. So thanks, Kat. I love that you just covered it. 
Let's cover some basics to help everybody get acquainted with our Urban Bee Lab. We've been around for over a decade, so we're a bit overdue for this, and I'm really excited for this opportunity. Thank you again to each of you for joining. Our high-level mission at the UBL is to analyze bee and biodiversity data and report results to elucidate trends and advance our understanding of global pollinator health. We also aim to educate, inspire, and build community through research programs and partnerships. Now, let me share another specific example with you of our research endeavors. It's right off the press and currently in peer review at an academic journal with lead author Katie Colbert who was an intern through MIT and is actually now a senior in high school. This example will show how our database is being leveraged by scientific partners. Now, Katie's project looked at our data on bee health and our national network of hives to understand where bees are thriving and why. She ascribed to our internal ethos of investigating not just where and why pollinators are dying, but rather flipping the question positively to explore where and why they're living and thriving. Now, Katie expanded on our internal concept of blue zones for pollinator health. Now, blue zones are geographic areas where humans are long lived. We take that concept and apply it to bees. We've added a parallel concept of red zones, or where bee health is quite poor geographically. Now, Katie pointed out that we missed the middle, so she added a new perspective by incorporating yellow zones. She analyzed our honey DNA samples, where Best Bees takes a deep dive into the forensic science within our network of research bee hives to identify the plant DNA present in honey. We use what's called scientifically eDNA, or environmental DNA genomics. Now, Katie used honey DNA to test the habitat hypothesis, which is something that I discussed in my last TEDx talk, and this explains bee health as a function of plant biodiversity. Now, Katie found statistically significant differences between healthy bees and not healthy bees in areas with more significant amounts of native plant populations. She also looked into what allows native plants to thrive in a modern world. She looked at our honey DNA samples from Best Bees beehives before and after after natural disasters, such as areas that were impacted by wildfires in Northern California, or even partners that were impacted by Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. And Katie found that native plant populations bounced back first, as detected by honey DNA, bees going around to forage, collecting information, and telling us about the plant community. Now, this might point to natural disasters as being nature's way to almost reset the ecosystem. As a whole, Katie's project has the potential to flip our attitudes all around climate change, from one that's really hopeless at a point right now, to being pragmatic with our curiosity into how we're taking advantage of the changing of the changing climate. Now we may one day consider those ravaged areas as nurseries for pollinator health as it pertains to native habitat abundance. We can choose to take action now by promoting and planting native plants in advance of those natural disasters so that their populations are strong enough to be there when that bounce back is most urgent and needed. So Go plant some native seeds right after this webinar, people. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> Noah, um, as you know, I had a chance to attend Katie's presentation at MIT this summer, and I would say that the Urban Bee Lab takes great pride in supporting her and other students who are eager to explore our data. In support of Katie and other students, the UBL Foundation exists to provide small grant funding in support of innovation, social and environmental justice and creative projects across the STEAM spectrum that relate to our mission and improve bee and pollinator health. And we're at a really exciting point in time when lots of general news and media outlets are once again talking about bees. And as a bee scientist, that feels super humbling. I appreciate so much knowing that the people care enough to put bees back in the headlines. Now, when we're at a point when UBL is talking about honeybees, we're not focusing on honeybees as much as seeing and using beehives as a research tool to interpret information about the health of all pollinators. This isn't a honeybee talk. This is a talk about bees and pollinators in general. Now we see honeybees as an indicator species that reflects the environment's condition around it. It's like a canary in a coal mine. And in the last year alone, 56% of our so-called canaries, these beehives, died in the US. 
The majority of beehives die every year. It's up to us to listen to those research beehives and ask the question, if the majority of managed beehives, canaries, died in the U.S. last year, then what's likely happening to the other 4,000 species of bees that are native to the U.S., not to mention the 200,000 other species of pollinators in general around the world? Without sufficient funding and personnel to study each species individually, we must consolidate resources by using indicator species like honeybees. And it's important to note that the mission of Best Bees in the UBL has always been from day one to improve the health of all bees. With more and more people talking about native pollinators and species beyond honeybees, it's really important to put this in context to bring everybody together and agree on what we're doing here. So what are research beehives? Well, Best Bees has hives all across the country in a wide variety of eco-regions and climates. They're located at our client home gardens and business rooftops and institutional campuses, like we mentioned, federal government facilities. Because our beekeeping practices are standardized, we can compare trends and patterns from these regions and examine the impact of the environment, weather patterns, and climate on pollinator health. And when we say standardized beekeeping, we mean that each of our beekeepers performs the same actions at the exact times of year to ensure the data we're collecting from beehives varies due to environmental and ecological conditions and not because of human intervention. How does our research make us different from other beekeeping providers? Well, honeybee hives alone on properties have a limited impact. The bees will pollinate, obviously, but native bees do that too. So when we're actively leveraging honeybees as the indicator species that they are by placing them in a nationwide research network where each hive is a living data point and it's up to us to listen to it. Now, Honey DNA is a great example of leveraging the global community of citizen scientists to cultivate data at a massive scale. Best Bees clients can purchase a Honey DNA report specific to their property. The Best Bees in-house research team analyzes these data points and then shares them with the client for their sustainability reporting and ESG initiatives by giving measures of biodiversity and measuring the impacts of landscape decisions on biodiversity as it pertains to pollinator health going forward. Then we hand that data over to UBL so we can go beyond that one client to the bigger picture, adding it to the interactive map that we discussed earlier that anybody can visit at, at urbanbeelab.org. Now, the UBL can use Honey DNA as a research tool to create greater change. And for example, Honey DNA gives us a unique perspective of what our neighborhoods taste like. These results have the power to build community by giving us the tools to quite literally describe, document, and share the flavor of our neighborhoods. They also empower us to disrupt the landscape industry, informing the planting decisions behind grounds, green rooftops, and corporate campuses. It also informs uh, those of us working to transform our lawns into pollinator meadows by basing our planting on the actual real science that we're learning from our local bees about what plants they like to forage on. Honey DNA allows us to listen to the bees and understand how we can synchronize our landscaping with their nutritional needs so we can best support our pollinator allies. That's amazing. So interesting. The Honey DNA program, I think, really sets the UBL and Best Bees apart. One of our goals, which falls into the citizen science category and would use existing beehives, is a multi-year research project where we start to identify seasonal trends in honeybee pollination. It includes metrics tied to carbon, biodiversity, nature, and mitigating the risks of climate change to business. The results of this research study would be used to improve bee health and develop a greater understanding of colony survival year over year. Another example of citizen science is where we focus on a specific apiary to sample from seasonally so we can get a full picture of the biodiversity of that given area. And this is where the UBL comes in handy because we aren't at the will of people purchasing the reports necessarily, but we can determine when and where to sample with research at the heart of that decision. Now the data gets collected, added to the interactive map, as you see here on the slide, that lives on the UBL website so anyone can access the information, which contributes to the global ecosystem. 
anyone around the world and for free. I mean, this is the beauty of having a nonprofit like UBL. We call this biodiversity mapping. We're kind of making this up as we go along at the forefront of science. It's something that we first explored with NASA and Google Earth back in 2018, when we worked with NASA scientists to create an algorithm that combined our own bee health data with their Earth observation satellites to inform a predictive model about where bees will best thrive and hopefully one day beekeepers and other types of pollinators and folks interested in pollinator habitat can use this tool to know where to place their pollinator habitat. And I would add, Noah, that here at the UBL, we are fortunate because we have these employees at the Best Bees who give their time, they volunteer their knowledge to analyze the data and ensure that it lands on a UBL map. And in the future, we'd love to increase the functionality of this map. And so we'd have multiple query options, which would benefit the greater science community. So on the topic of building community here, so how can Honeybee Research support native bees and other pollinators while empowering change through community efforts and innovation? Well, being able to leverage Honeybee data and our team's expertise has opened some really unique doors for not only innovating through research with UBL, but using Honeybee Research as a tool for community involvement. I love this photo. I just want to point out that this is a photo of Parker and Jim on the slide. This past summer, we spent some time with 10-year-old Parker Kelsey, and he's photographed here with Red Sox legend Jim Lomborg, who is also a beekeeper, and he shared his experience with Parker, and he really brought the bees to life for him. We had learned that Parker had built a bee habitat for his school project last spring, and he wanted to help the UBL raise awareness and funds. And so he launched a pollinator champion campaign, which quickly raised over $2,500 in support of our programs. And we're super proud of him for that. So fundraising campaigns are a big part of growing our nonprofit. Over the next few months, you'll be hearing about Urban Waggle, or maybe you've already heard about it. This is a live storytelling event where novice and experienced story storytellers will take the stage with a the theme of honey, personal narratives that can be loosely and creatively pitched as sticky, sweet, or raw. Okay. Our pitch line is open until October 4th. So if you have a story to tell and you live in the Boston area, please go to our website and send in your pitch. And if this goes well, we'd like to bring it to some other cities in the United States. We also have some exciting plans in the works for Giving Tuesday, and that's that'll take place at the end of November. We hope you'll tune in that day to support our efforts. And financial support really does allow the UBL to innovate. Let's talk about what is coming down the innovation pipeline this year at the UBL. In addition to the programs I talked about earlier, our big picture focus is on re-emerging and growing our audience. We hope to refine our mission and goals and tell our story so that we can advance our programming efforts across the United States. So cool. I mean, there's so much potential here for collaboration between Best Bees and UBL and the greater scientific community. We can't wait to continue to explore ways to leverage UBL's nonprofit status in future partnerships, like we did in past collaborations with NASA and hopefully future ones with them too. I'm also really excited to continue finding creative and impactful ways to leverage our research and data collection. And I want to share with you another example. Now, this is a favorite secret project of ours that's been in the works since 2015. So much of what we're sharing with you today has really never been shared before. And, uh, you know, as a scientist, when we have to just kind of stay quiet with things, I have a hard time because we really want to just build community around these things. So this project is site-specific pollinator habitats, where we cultivate gardens directly informed by the area's specific honey DNA results, putting our research into practice. I mean, on our social media at Best Bees and at Urban Bee Lab, we're often sharing images of client sites that have pollinator habitat gardens and green rooftops beside our beehives, it goes so much more beyond honeybees, and it always has. Another example of how we're expanding research is a pollinator DNA project. That's what we're now calling it. We're assessing the traces of animal DNA found on flowers that we're planting in gardens based on honey DNA. We're aiming to identify the presence of native bees, like the blue orchard bee, or as our team lovingly refers to as BOBS for the acronym B-O-B, -B, blue orchard bee. Now, Best Bees installed Blue Orchard Bees, or BOBs, and bee hotels at select research sites across the U.S. for the past two years. Pollinator DNA will be able to, de to detect the presence of any of those 200,000 species of pollinators, including hummingbirds and butterflies, our poll fan favorites here today. 
I love to see these so often at our California field sites, and now we're going to be able to detect them in a non-intrusive and cryptic way by looking at their animal DNA left on the flowers that we're planting based on what our research beehives are telling us from their honey DNA. It all goes full circle. All of this marks a shift from beekeeping services, which is what we started as in 2010, to where we're at now, what we call Applied Biodiversity Solutions that powers our partnership between Best Bees and UBL. It's it's all so exciting, really. I um, I think we're just like, we're poised for advan advancement on so many different fronts. We're continuing our research endeavors while also expanding our community and educational program. And I just wanna go back to a minute and talk about Katie, our research intern, and give her a nod to the work that she accomplished last summer regarding native seeds. One of our goals in 2024 is to increase native seed distribution to community gardens and schools in urban areas where Best Bees has operations. This would allow us to further our honey DNA testing while leading on our pillars of education, inspiration, and building community. And as we get to the end of this webinar, as we're closing in, I wanna bring Delaney back so we have some time for our Q&A. We love questions. Let's hear from y'all. Awesome. Thank you guys. That was so fun and really interesting just to get some more details and see some of the projects coming down the pipeline. It's just really fun and makes me feel really excited and encouraged about the future of health of bees and all pollinators. So without further ado, if folks want to go ahead and use that Q&A module or the chat and send over questions that you would like to have answered by our bee scientist and expert, Noah, and by our UBL director, Kat, please send those in. Um, I'll be grabbing those questions and starting to throw them out to you guys. Noah, Kat, you guys ready for some questions? Yes. Yeah, we love this. Ask All right. Them live. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My first question will be for you, Noah, but... Why is sharing research and sharing data publicly important to you and important to Best Bees and UBL together? Yeah, so I wanted to start a company after so many years in, in academia. You know, I was in academia for 11 years, publishing over 20 papers on termites, on wasps, on humans, on bees, and thinking, what am I doing? <laughs> Who's reading these? I'm writing this, there's so much more. I'm spending years on one paper. And not getting paid, right? Oftentimes the scientists have to pay to publish and then the journal charges the reader sometimes $20 to read one chapter. So the financial model was really broken. And anybody who knows students out there or teachers knows these are not well-funded people. They work very hard. And the work we were doing, I felt was really important. And I was not believing in the system anymore of thinking that a peer reviewed publication was enough. And when we were walking around school, we would see each other as the number of publications we had. It was very ego driven. Oh, that person has 21 publications. They have 104. I have none, so I suck. And I was like, this is all ridiculous. We're missing the point. We're missing the impact. We're missing the community that we can build. And when bees started dying in 2006, disappearing from colony collapse disorder, people started to come to me and say, why are bees disappearing? I want to know the answer so that I can help. It made me realize that not only was this a kind of a broken system, but there was a different system. There was a market demand. There was a wide open space in the market to empower people, citizens, homeowners, businesses. And now with the businesses have to report on things like nature and biodiversity, we're seeing a lot more accountability coming into the space of what's called non-financial accounting. So ESG and sustainability reports, that means budgets are going towards companies to get involved in community building. They want data so that they're not greenwashing. They're not doing things that aren't based in actually making a measurable, tangible impact. So all of those things combined really started us. That's the origin of why we wanted to do a nonprofit as well as a beekeeping service uh, biodiversity solution business and get people involved, get people energized and inform them on how to have these conversations too, because Kat and you and I are not going to be here forever. So it takes a village. It takes all of us to start to spread the gospel and to empower people with the facts and the talking points and to make sure everybody knows it's great to have a conversation. We want to bring everybody in. So this requires community. We can't change the world on our own. And we really welcome everybody into the conversation. That's incredible. And if folks that are in attendance today have not uh, gone to the UBL website and explored the interactive map, I highly encourage it. Uh, it's just 
so interesting to see. And it's such a huge amount of data to be able just to access in a really user-friendly way and dig into a little deeper. I'll ask one of my team members that's attending, if you can drop the UVL link into the chat and that way everyone can have it, that would be super helpful. All right, next question, Kat, what drew you to wanting to work in the nonprofit space specifically with bees and pollinators specifically? What was that interest and where did it come from? Well, I think before I go into the very specifics of bees and pollinators, I've always worked in not the nonprofit industry. And for a long time, I was involved in human services. Um, and, you know, it's it's not entirely different to focus on bees and pollinators, um, which sometimes feel like either a, a marginalized community or someone who doesn't necessarily have a voice and, and may need some help. And so helping people. Um, kind of translated as well. And I um, care deeply about the environment. I I have my own garden. I'd like to grow vegetables. And so, and I can see what's happening, um, you know, broadly. And I felt like it was a really um, timely opportunity to come in and um, apply what I had learned in the nonprofit industry to a, a, um, a mission that I really care deeply about. I love that. That's beautiful, Kat. Thanks. All right, we'll hop into the next question. Uh, there's a couple questions regarding native plants and native plant seeds. Um, I'll throw this to Kat first, because I know you have some exciting projects coming down the pipeline for this. Um, how can people get access to wildflower, pollinator seed mixes, native plant seeds, and maybe give a teaser on a program you have coming up around that topic? <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, so my understanding, my own personal knowledge, um, I there's a garden center not too far from me and um, they actually cultivate and they have native seeds. They're super, um, in, they have tons of information. So if you're, it's a great place to start, I think, is going locally and finding out, um, you know, what's appropriate for the space that you want to grow in. Um, we are piloting a program um, with funding from Cape Cod Five Bank, and we're going to start rolling this out locally and just see how it takes off. But we are looking to distribute uh, native seeds to all of our apiaries in Massachusetts as a way of sort of testing out some of our hypotheses about planting and letting those seeds sow over the winter and then looking at testing the honey um, over the next couple of years and seeing how that kind of translates from what we've planted. Um, it's exciting and I can't wait to share more as we roll that out. I love that. Can I add to that too? Please. You know, just building off of, of Kat's leadership here and giving an example of sourcing native seeds within Kat's own local community, we always like to combine the concepts of ecological and environmental sustainability with economic sustainability. So for anybody looking for information or sourcing native seeds, go to your own local garden center, really like a local like mom and pop one versus like no shade at Home Depot or Lowe's, like cool, do your thing. But if you go to local, local, they're really going to understand what's native because they know your community, they're in it versus a very large chain. They might not have that specific information because they're operating at such a high level. So when you talk to them, and maybe even if you bring honey DNA results to them, like for free at the urbanbeelab.org website, if you say, hey, like, here's what we're looking at from our local community, we're seeing these as the top five types of plants. Do any of these stand out to you as, as native ones that you might recommend planting? Or do you have other ones to recommend? When you keep your money in your local community, you're also helping to keep that economy sustainable and operating in a virtuous cycle that we love to promote too. I'm also just going to share one more note on the concept of native. So as an ecologist, there's a concept called a shifting baseline, where what's normal today might not have been normal 400 years ago or 4,000 years ago. One example is cities. That's not normal, this built environment, when it's all covered in concrete. That's not a native environment. And so native things might not thrive best there, unlike some other plants that might. And so when we want to consider the built environment, think about things that would do really well on green rooftops. Um, I have a colleague who spent six or seven years on her PhD, understanding what plants grew best on rooftops other than sedum. And at the end, she said it's sedum and walked out the door. <laughs> 
So it's a really challenging and harsh environment, and it's important to consider not just native things, but what actually works. We don't want to just pay lip service. We want to see how we can make an impact there. Another example with coral reefs and a changing water temperature and a changing world, we can't just throw in what's native from 100 years ago because it's changed so much. So I wanted to just add that there and invite anybody who wants to advance the conversation um, to, to reach out to us. We're always happy to engage. Yes, definitely. And I'll add to Bespies, uh works really hard to provide free educational content on gardening and planting. And uh, I'm sure one of my team members can also drop in some links to our blog uh, and some gardening tips, especially as it pertains to regional and native plantings that can support pollinators. So keep an eye out on our blog as well. All right, let's keep going. I feel like this will be kind of a tri tricky question, but I'm curious to see if you know the answer now. <laughs> do you know how many samples of honey DNA we have tested, or do you have a sense of the scope of testing that we've done? Is it national? Is it international? You know, what do you know? <laughs> uh, Kat, do you know? Here's my. <laughs> The number 675 stands out to me, but I don't know if that is um, over time or if that's like over the last few years. And I feel like that's probably more recent, a, a recent number, not over time, um, but we could find out. At least that many. Yeah. I remember when we debuted this at MIT, this is a funny nerdy story where I debuted the world's first edible genome, sticks of honey at a coffee and tea break at a conference at MIT. And I was standing next to the coffee and tea station, like with my nerdy bee tie and a little placard that said, this honey contains like 47% chrysanthemum and 17% roses or whatever the results were, thinking everybody's gonna be like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And nobody, <laughs> nobody noticed. So we've come a very long way. That was around 2015, 2016. So I would say that number, Kat, sounds like it's maybe of all time. Um, and it is totally global. We've done really cool projects like across the country of Nigeria with honey producers there to map out the pollinator habitat and to empower them with just information to know, well, what do we want to promote? And also we've worked with the World Bank and countries like Haiti, Benin, Ethiopia to understand how with this science, they can start to sell honey for a little bit more 50 cents a dollar more to know what their country tastes like like we're doing with manuka honey in new zealand everybody knows how expensive manuka honey is and that's because the government is empowered with science to say our honey our land our product tastes like this it's a specialty product so they charge so much more money and again it's a connection between ecological and economic sustainability that through our science and our support and our partnership any country can do i love that Awesome. Um, let's jump into our next question for Kat. Uh, does UPL have any volunteer opportunities coming up or any information about how folks can support in different ways volunteering or not? That's such a great question. Um, and we, as Noah pointed out earlier, we cannot do this alone. And so volunteers are always welcome. Um, I think right now, because I've only been here a few months, we're still trying to flesh out what does that look like. But I will say one of the ideas that we've sort of floated around is what does it look like to be a guerrilla gardener and, and go and volunteer on your own time in support of UBL and perhaps even just going out and sowing seeds. Um, and so that's something that we're looking to roll out in 2024. And anybody who is interested in volunteering should definitely get in touch with me. Um, you can reach me at info at urbanbeelab.org and I will be happy to connect um, individually offline and see what we can work out. Amazing. Awesome. And for donations, are those donations tax deductible? That's another question we've received. Yes, 100% tax deductible. We're a registered 501c3. Um, we accept donations across the board um, from personal checks to online contributions. We will take um, donor advised fund contributions, anything like that. And if anybody wants to reach out and talk about what larger contributions might look like in terms of stock, um, those are an option as well. Awesome. Thank you, Kat. All right, let me sort through 
Uh, I'll just say one other oh. thing on the topic of contributions and donations too. So through this unique partnership between Best Bees and UBL, it's what the government calls a commercial co-venture. So Best Bees actually covers the overhead. So the office for UBL is located in Best Bees headquarters. Best Bees doesn't charge UBL for that. It covers the lights and the phones and the internet and all that, that other stuff that sometimes in making a donation to an institution, folks might think, oh, it's going to overhead. And that's not the case here. This really goes to our programming. And that's a, a unique aspect to why we wanted to do it in our own way. I love That's that. Great, great point. Thank you. Yeah, great context. Um, another question for you, Kat, is more info on the upcoming storytelling event. <laughs> Tell us this more is about so it. exciting. <laughs> so Urban Waggle, the Urban Waggle is taking place on Thursday, November 30th. It's a uh, piloted fundraiser. Um, it's not much different from what if you've ever been to a moth um, event or listened to it. It's live stories told on stage. Um, we have given the broad theme of honey, obviously, to tie back to our mission, but it's really stories, um, personal narratives that don't have to do anything to do with bees or pollinators they can be personal narratives if you were in a sticky situation or perhaps it has something that has a sweet ending um, or maybe it's kind of raw and emotional and you want to get up on stage and tell it so we are testing this out in our Boston area and we're going to see if it works really well we may consider bringing it to some other cities where we have um, uh, beehives and clients in best bee cities and um the advantage for anyone who wants to take stage and they're going to get professional coaching and a stipend. So it's an exciting time for us. And um, right now we are looking for people to pitch their stories. So if you live in the area and you're excited about this, or you want to learn more, you can go to our website and learn about the event there, or you can reach out to me directly and I'd be happy to um, give you some more information. And I just want to add one other thing here, too. So this isn't just that we're recruiting people to tell stories on stage and to come sit and watch. Kat has arranged through her amazing experience, thank you, Kat, um, for coaching, speaker coaching, to be included for these speakers. And one story that I love relating to this is a dear, dear colleague of mine whom I love and adore from graduate school was always shy and quiet. And they would come to conferences and not present. And the one student who wouldn't present, even though their work was really amazing. And there was an event, a storytelling event in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where they got up on stage and they told a story and it was amazing. It was about poison dart frogs in South America. And we're like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And they built up this experience over time to become a main stage TED speaker. So anytime somebody has a story to tell and has that little tickle inside, this is one of those opportunities for Urban Waggle where we are for free to them, pairing them up with that coach to help them build confidence and experience and set them up for success in a friendly and loving audience for a really good cause. So I just want to point that out. This is a really different, unique experience that Kat, from her knowledge, knows <laughs> how to pull off and how to really help everybody involved. So definitely consider and spread the word, especially we're looking for to recruiting a diverse audience. Audience. We welcome people from all walks of life. So help us spread the word. Awesome. Thank you guys. I'm really excited to go to that event. I have it marked in my calendar. I'm terrified to speak on a stage like that, but I am going to be in full support of everyone <laughs> on that stage talking. <laughs> You're a great presenter. Look at you now. <laughs> oh, thanks. All right. Um, I'm going to try and get through a couple more questions. So kind of a last call for folks in attendance to drop in any final questions that you want answered. I'm going to try and combine a couple questions that are somewhat similar. So apologies if I misword some things as I'm trying to combine these. Uh, this question will be for Noah around the data we collect. So the data we collect can have a lot of uses. We've talked a lot today about using the honey DNA data to inform planting decisions. What other data does Best Bees collect and how does that inform decisions for beekeepers or clients um, as it regards to planting, but maybe other decision-making as well? Yeah. Okay. So we collect a lot of data right now. Over 70 data points are manually entered by our beekeepers in our proprietary software at every hive visit. 
we are now doing an investment fundraiser to help us bring advanced technology through remote sensors to market rapidly. So for anybody who wants to help us with that smart hive project uh, and wants to invest to get us up to, I think it'll be a thousand data points in real time, um, definitely reach out. Now to this question, what do we do with the data? It's really an important question because as scientists, we have limited resources and we've got to stay focused. So we have so many really interesting findings that I always say if there are any beekeeping clubs, that really want us to come and do a deep dive to give us an invitation to speak. We can do that remotely or in person. You know, right now, Best Bees operates in 25 different cities. It covers a lot of ground. So we can do a deep dive there. But I'll just share some highlights. We see that beehives on rooftops tend to do very, very well. We see that flowers are what is associated with saving bees. We see that varroa mites are the thing that's killing bees. People already know these things, I know, but I have to tell you, we've thrown every scientific research tool at these. Like I mentioned genomics and virology and pesticide, just every single scientific thing. And it comes down to flowers and mites. Um, we have this new technology with our Smart Hive program to kill mites using a chemical-free method that works. There are a couple companies doing this now. It's amazing tech, and that's the future of killing mites. It's not going to be where we're at now with two, three different chemical treatments a year that kill the bees. Um, but that really is the best that the general market is left with until we're able to bring this to market. So the future is bright. Even right now for killing mites is a little bit darker. We do have data internally showing that in terms of high density, bees do better when there are more bees in the area. There are many research papers out there that say in areas with limited resources that there might be a carrying capacity issue that needs to be determined further. Um, we see that if you have, for many areas, two boxes over winter, they do better than three or one. Um, so a lot of deep dives that are specific to beekeepers that I want to just invite you to maybe reach out offline and maybe we can do a presentation or share some slides and data to your beekeeping club to maximize the impact. I love that, Noah. Yeah, there's, uh, as you mentioned, so much data is being collected and it's being used by our beekeepers. And then also Best Bees creates pretty amazing, I'm very proud of them, reports on essentially what that data meant throughout the beekeeping season and how our clients can make really informed decisions around the location of the hive, the water source of the hive, the habitat surrounding. Um, there's so much that we can be doing to support bees and for other pollinators as well that we're really lucky to get to collect that data and help our clients inform those types of decisions. So it's really fun. All right. So Noah and Kat, do you guys have any final questions for each other before we wrap up and say thank yous? I don't have any other questions. <laughs> I love that. It's good to ask, you know? <laughs> thank you though. I appreciate yeah. you moderating. <laughs> I'll just share, you know, for folks who are working now or know people who are, if you have a company that has volunteer opportunities, maybe some philanthropic giving, combined with any goals, benchmarks, or interests in sustainability or biodiversity or landscape or empty rooftops, it's really interesting to combine all of those. So we want to encourage people, whether it's at home or at companies, to reach out to us to think what ways we can combine this. Maybe there are ways to transform unused property into a leveraged asset, something that's valuable for people and planet. And of course, for profits, all of this can help people and companies make some more money as well. So think about reaching out to us to combine any of the interests that you've heard about today. We always love to hear feedback. We're here for you. And we really appreciate your interest and your time today. It means so much to us. So thank you. Can I add one more thing though? <laughs> um, I guess uh, one of the other ways, so as we talk about making financial contributions, but also um, one way to sort of really help us leverage what we're doing is following us on social media. We, you can find the Urban Bee Lab um, across Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn at Urban Bee Lab. Um, because those are ways that we can sort of connect at a greater, in a, in a, in a more broad uh, way with the community online. And um, in addition, I just wanted to sort of say like even donations as small as 25 or $50 help support funding for native bee habitats, where larger donations would help us fund student, student pollinator clubs or increase our research efforts on a global scale. So I just wanted to leave that and just also say thank you for everybody who participated today. 
Awesome. Well, thank you to everyone who came and attended on your Friday. Um, as a reminder, we'll send out a recording via email of this webinar in case you have anyone that you'd like to share it with. If we did not get to your question or comment in the chat, we'll be sure to answer those questions in the email follow-up. Uh, and we hope to see you around. Follow us on social, send us emails. Let's connect and talk more. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, there is a survey once you exit the webinar to take and to just give us some feedback on what you thought of today's webinar and how we might be able to continue creating events like this that support you and support pollinators. So thank you guys. Thanks for being here. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thanks again. Awesome. Thank you guys.